Sometimes life is full of cliches. Yes, cliches exist for a reason, because they are common occurrences or sayings. Well, my life has recently become a cliche when it comes to my wife of 10 years. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Martin Baxter, and I run my own salsa business here in Santa Barbara, California. I have at my disposal every type of Mexican, Central, and South American pepper known to man. I even recently started making habanero salsa. People like it, but in very small doses. It also seems to be very popular in colleges as part of hazing. Some of my best buyers for really cool stuff are fraternities. Go figure it out. I have always loved spicy food, so it was natural that I got into this business. As for how my wife fits into some of life's cliches, Cindy has become distant lately. Yes, I know. Anyway, now I know. And this is another cliche. When we got married 10 years ago, we were both madly in love with each other. I had just gotten out of the military and was opening my first salsa store. I saved quite a bit of my money and signed up for a few online cooking classes while I was at home. That kept me sane in Afghanistan for that first year, and then I got out and was ready to go into some business. Back then, before the recession caused by the widespread bursting of the housing bubble, getting a loan was easy. But even today, my salsa business, Baxter's Burner, is still thriving. The problem, however, is not my business, as you can probably guess. No, the problem was my wife and the fact that she cheated on me. The way I found out about it was a big cliché. Well, not quite. The most common cliché is to come home early and find them in bed together. No, the second big cliché is walking away, forgetting something, then coming back and overhearing a conversation about them getting together while I was busy at work and our son was at school. Yes, we have a child together. Brian Baxter, named after Cindy's father. Oh, and before you ask, yes, he's mine. I know he is mine because he was conceived on our honeymoon and we were together every moment of every day alone on her father's yacht. Also, I gave him a DNA test after I found out about her and the asshole she was having sex with on the side. The way it all happened was another cliché. I forgot my laptop, which had my ready-made formula for the new singed salsa. Yes, yes, I know. Not too original, but the fact that it was the purest habanero you can get in paste form was something. Of course, we added other elements to it along the way. But I was planning on putting together the first batch that day. I needed this laptop, and I went back as quietly and quickly as I could to pick it up. As I entered my den, I heard her walking down the hallway and talking on the phone. Of course, I could only hear half of her conversation. Hello, sexy. Yes. This idiot went to work. Chuckles. Yeah, don't worry. Today you will get something he never had. Mmm, you guessed it. I want you to set my ass on fire with that big stick, baby. Oh, hell yes. My world collapsed. I numbly packed up my laptop and headed back to my car. Hell, I don't even remember driving to the store. When I got there, Becky was behind the counter and Sari was sitting with a customer, giving him the last of our medium-hot zesty salsa that put pace to shame. I managed to fake a smile as I wondered what I should do now. Divorce, of course. Cindy's father didn't trust me when I first met and married his daughter, so I had to sign a prenuptial agreement. The prenuptial agreement stated that in the event of adultery, the party who committed the offense would leave the marriage with nothing in the event of a divorce. It wasn't a one-way street, because I wouldn't have signed it if it was. Then all these cliché questions popped into my head. How long has she been cheating with him? Why is she even having sex with him? Was I not good enough for her? Why is she disrespecting me towards him? If she's so unhappy, why hasn't she divorced me yet? How am I going to prove her adultery? That's when it dawned on me, the most cunning plan I've ever come up with. And after thinking about what I was planning, I realized that I didn't feel any guilt about it. I looked at all the positives I had. My manhood in pants had no complaints, and I know how to use it. I've lived long enough to know the difference between a fake climax and a real one, and Cindy hasn't faked it even once in the ten years we've been married. I always gave it to her several times. It couldn't be about sex. Could it be? Damn, for God's sake, I memorized this fucking Kama Sutra. I was still in good shape, working out three times a week and running five days a week. Yes. 
I was still following my own physical therapy regimen from the time I was in the hospital. But the plan itself, upon further reflection, was perhaps the most insidious plan of revenge that anyone had ever devised. You see, hot chili peppers like habanero affect the mucous membranes in your mouth. However, have you ever eaten something very spicy and the next day sat on the toilet screaming, get ice cream, as you relieved yourself? Yes, I became a real sadist when I thought about how I was going to take revenge. What I had in mind should have provided a very fun time, at least for me. Now I just needed a delivery system. I prepared a small batch in record time and invited the girls to try it. Each of them had to fan her mouth and eat a lot of bread to put out the fire. They both then enthusiastically gave me thumbs up for my efforts. However, I still needed a delivery system. The day passed quickly, and although I always enjoyed interacting with the young ladies I hired, I heated home early. I stopped by my lawyer's office and asked him to draw up divorce papers sitting adultery as the reason. I told him that in a day or two, I would have some evidence. He was reluctant at first, but when I told him about the conversation I had heard that morning, he was sympathetic and nodded in agreement. Then I left his office and went home. As I turned onto my street, I saw a small red Mercedes sport coupe pull out of my driveway and head towards me. The man driving was blonde, blue-eyed, and had a smug grin on his face. This idiot's face. I recognized him as a guy from one of Cindy's social events we went to. He always asked her to dance, and she always agreed to these dances. Now I know why. My anger rose again, and I was more than ready to put my plan into action. The hardest part was acting normal when I got home. I wasn't going to show my cards to this bitch before I could play. I took a deep breath, then went inside. I put the smile of my best loving husband on my face. Hi, darling. Cindy greeted me with enthusiasm. She had obviously just taken a shower, as her hair was still very damp. Her long blonde locks fell over her shoulders, and I was once again captivated by her beauty. But physical beauty is one thing. The internal ugliness surpasses this. After the conversation she had with Asshole that morning, her outer beauty no longer had the same effect on me as before. Hello, sexy lady. Did you shower at this time of day? I asked playfully, touching her hair. Yes, I had a good workout earlier. She smiled and kissed me. Yes, I bet you did. Well, your workout tomorrow will be much more interesting, I thought to myself. She said dinner would be ready in an hour. So I kissed her again and headed down the hall to our bedroom. The smell of the room freshener almost drowned out the smell of sex, but at least they changed the sheets on the bed. I almost went without dinner when I thought about getting into that bed with her tonight. I would burn it at the first opportunity. And then a thought struck me. They must have used some kind of lube to have sex using her ass. Hmm. I rummaged through her nightstand and sure enough, there was a tube of cherry jelly that we use sometimes. Son of a bitch. I opened the lid, and it was almost the same shade of red as the salsa I made with the white-hot flame inside. I grinned as I completely removed the cap from the cream, squeezed some into the toilet, flushed it, then poured some paste from a small bottle of salsa into the tube. I replaced the cap and squeezed it, stirring inside the tube itself. Then I took the lid off again and put more salsa in it. Then he repeated the process. Once I thought everything was mixed enough, I removed the cap and squeezed a little. I smelled it and, of course, it was delicious. I washed my finger and put the cap back on, then put it in her nightstand exactly the way I found it. I was now in a much better mood and took a nice long shower. Then I went out to have dinner. I was wearing blue jeans, a t-shirt, and a smile on my face. God, it smells so delicious. I sat down at the table with enthusiasm. I opened a bottle of beer, and we all started eating her lasagna. God, I'm going to miss her cooking. I'll probably miss sex with her even more than I was going to. Brian returned home and sat in his seat between Cindy and me. We talked about his day at school, and Cindy told him to do his homework. Yes, she is also a very good mother for him. Sexually, Cindy was always a quick learner, very experienced and enthusiastic. So yes, I enjoyed having sex with her, whether it was sex or lovemaking. It's always been special. 
For a few moments, I considered the consequences of what I was about to do. Petty revenge on my cheating wife and her stupid lover. Then a divorce, which would have left her nothing of our married life together. She could sue for custody of Brian and maybe even win. I love my son, and I really didn't want him to be bullied by her after our divorce. I already planned this too. I indicated in the divorce papers that I wanted full custody of my son and that I would allow her frequent visitation, but only under my supervision. I didn't want him to become dependent on her idiotic lover who might just try to take my place as Brian's father. The pain in my heart did not leave me that evening, and soon I asked for leave, saying that I needed to sleep. I told Cindy that I wasn't feeling well and that I had tried some really spicy salsa at work, so she smiled sympathetically and said goodnight. First I went into my den, and grabbed my old mini video camera and mini tape recorder. The last time I used a video camera was during our last anniversary vacation when we went to Disneyland, and the last time I used a voice recorder was when I was just starting out to record my thoughts before buying a laptop. I then went into our bedroom and placed the video camera behind some DVDs under our TV so it had a good view of the bed. I made sure the little green light was taped over so it wouldn't give itself away when I turned it on in the morning. However, the battery was fully charged. Fine. A whopping eight hours of footage, considering I started it right before I left in the morning. I hid the recorder under the bed, but didn't start recording yet. The small memory card in the recorder also allows you to record for eight hours. The battery was also fully charged. I grinned. It was obvious that this asshole had been here all day and they finished just in time for both of them to shower before he left. If I hadn't turned onto my street a little earlier, I might never have seen him. The only possible problem with my plan was that they might not do anything the next day. Well, if not, then I would continue in the same vein until I caught them in the act. I then used my cell phone to call Becky. I told her I was going to take a few days off, but if Cindy called to tell her I was in a meeting with a client. Then I explained the situation, but only that I was trying to catch them red-handed, and she said, No problem, boss. Becky is a good person, and she knows that I would never cheat on Cindy. She also has stunning Puerto Rican heritage. She has been working in the store for five years and knows a lot about running a business. Sleep lasted a long time that night. I kept thinking about what might happen in the morning or what might happen in a few days. From the way she was talking to him, they had been having sex for a while now. I've already figured out what to do in the morning and every morning after that, if it comes to that. After I turn on the camera and recorder, I sneak out of the house, drive around the alley behind our house and drive through the gate in the alley directly under our bedroom window. From this vantage point, I could hear everything that was going on. I sneak in a cooler outside with snacks, beer, and soda. One of those great coolers that will keep you cold for days as long as the battery is charged. I finally fell asleep praying that something would happen sooner rather than later. I woke up the next morning and got dressed as usual. I waited until Cindy took a shower, then turned on the camera and recorder and left the house as usual. It didn't take me long to walk around the back of the house and slip inside through the gate in the alley. I left my car there as I hoped to only be there for a short time. After Cindy sent Brian to school, she was on the phone again. She invited him back to her place, and based on her confirmation, he would be there in 20 minutes. I grinned. I made sure that I would not be seen through the window, neither by this asshole, nor by my cheating slut, nor by the camera, which had an amazing view of the room. I stopped at the nearest pharmacy around the corner from our house and bought a new tube of cherry jelly, which was Cindy's favorite. It was a flash of inspiration to cover my tracks, just in case. I returned home ten minutes later, and within fifteen minutes I was sitting under my bedroom window with five minutes to spare. Then I sat under the window, opened the refrigerator, and pulled out a ham and Swiss cheese sandwich and a cold microbrewery ale. I was sipping it slowly, between bites of my sandwich enjoying the rich flavor, when I heard assholes Mercedes pull up in the driveway. Apparently, they didn't care if the neighbors saw it. I decided it would be a shame if something bad happened to Ashol's trip. So as soon as I heard the front door open and close, I slipped around the corner of the house and then out the side gate. 
I had a pocket knife with me and decided to carve adultery asshole on his door. Oh, my revenge might land me in jail, but I was going to have a hell of a lot of fun doing it. I tried the handle of his door, and lo and behold, this arrogant idiot left it unlocked. Well, we lived in a nice area, and nothing bad happened during the day. I checked his glove compartment and found his registration card and insurance. John Lawson Now Asshole had a name, but I was going to keep calling him Asshole. It was easier to remember. I took his registration card and insurance and put them in my pocket. Then I decided it would be really fun to trim his valve stems a little, so I sawed them halfway. I heard the screams start and called Paul, my lawyer, and told him the game was on. I let him know that the evidence would be ready in a couple of hours at most, and that he would prepare the trial and name Mr. John Lawson on the divorce papers for adultery. Then I slipped back into the backyard and heard them screaming in pain from the hottest salsa on earth through the window, which, figuratively speaking, set their butts on fire. I sat down under the window and took a sip of some more ale. I let a wicked grin cross my face and I had to stifle my laughter as they tried to figure out what was going on. Oh God, why is my man instrument burning? Your instrument? My ass is on fire. Damn it, how it pains. Ah! Finally, I got up and decided to go inside. Oh shit, I think I forgot my laptop again. I went and drove my car back into the driveway, then went inside to find the asshole and the slut writhing in agony as they tried like crazy to get into the shower and douse themselves with cold water to put out the fire. Approaching the bathroom door, I gathered all my anger together. What the hell is going on here? I roared. This picture was priceless. The asshole had a big tool. Very big. Probably at least 25 centimeters. She was also red and swollen due to the salsa getting into her private area. He was uncircumcised, and the salsa got under his foreskin. I felt some very deep satisfaction at this turn of events. Then I looked at my wife, whose butt and beyond were crimson red from the irritation and intense burning caused by the 450,000 hot pepper jelly. Oh my God, Marty! She screamed and then squealed in pain. Please, Marty, I am so sorry. She squealed again, and the asshole also begged not to harm him. I kept a learned mask of anger and distrust on my face. I stepped forward and delivered a hell of a punch to asshole's jaw, sending him flying back into the wall of the shower stall. Then I delivered several brutal blows to the groin area. At this point, I took out my cell phone and called 911. While asshole was unconscious and slut, Cindy was literally crying and screaming at the top of her lungs. I grabbed the fake tube of cream and replaced it with a new one, breaking the seal and removing a few smears from it. I then went to my car and threw the fake tube under the back seat. I would throw it later in a dumpster behind a gas station or something. I told the 911 operator that I came home to get my laptop for work and found my wife in the shower with her lover. I told her that there seemed to be something very wrong with both of them and that their genitals were swollen and red. She sent the police and ambulance to my address. I thanked her and hung up. So our neighbor across the street, Mrs. Kendall, was a real bore and the queen of local gossip. I knew she knew about assholes' daily visits, so when the EMTs and cops arrived, I walked across the street to talk to her. Oh, hi, Marty, she said with a smile, opening her door. Hello, Mrs. Kendall. By any chance, have you seen this little red Mercedes outside my house before? I asked with a smile. Why not over the last few months, actually? Every day from Monday to Friday. She smiled, her seeming innocence belying the fact that she had actually known about it for so long. Thank you, Mrs. Kendall. Hmm. Did you see anything strange this morning other than a red Mercedes driving up? I asked. Nothing, dear. She said, so she did not see how I damaged his car. I saw you leave, and then Brian heated to the bus stop. He then got there about 20 minutes after Brian left. Then I went to watch my morning shows, and when I came back, you were just pulling up to the house. Thank you, Mrs. Kendall. Do you mind if the police take your statement? I asked. Oh, not at all, dear. I will do everything in my power to help. 
said the little old lady who knew more about the affairs of other people than they themselves. Thank you very much, ma'am. I smiled, hugged her, then walked back to my side of the street to the waiting cops. I called Becky and asked if she would tell me that I was there in the morning but forgot my laptop. She asked why and I told her the short version of what happened. She laughed until she dropped and promised to become my alibi. She said that she would invite Sari to participate in this too. I thanked her, then went and talked to the detective who had just shown up. Are you Mr. Baxter? He asked. Yes, sir. I nodded. He continued to question me about my whereabouts, and I told him that I went to work at my salsa store but forgot my laptop. When I returned, I heard screams and found my wife and her lover in the shower, screaming for some unknown reason. I admitted that I lost my temper and attacked a man who was trespassing on my property, and the detective said he would worry about it later. The female ER doctor was finally able to cool Cindy's privates enough with the aloe cream to make her coherent enough to ask questions. She walked over, grabbed the tube of cream from the bedside table, and handed it to the detective, who bagged it as evidence. I told the detective that my wife and I sometimes used it to get extra sensations during lovemaking, which was true, or used to be, so that my fingerprints on it do not arouse suspicion. Another thing is the car. But since Mrs. Kendall had been watching me since I returned in my car after ruining Asshole's trip, she was more than willing to sign a written statement as my alibi. I always liked that old boar. I swore I didn't know who wrote all that on his door, but I promised to shake the guy's hand if I ever met him. He did me a favor. When Cindy and Ashole were transported to the hospital for observation and some tests, I went in and collected my evidence. I took the video camera out from behind the DVDs, then took the voice recorder out from under the bed. I stopped both recordings and went to my den to load the memory cards onto my laptop. I cut the video after I walked in and caught them, so it wasn't there when I replaced the tube of cream. I also cut the same amount of time from the voice recording. Detective Crawford walked into my office as I was finishing up my creative deletions. He told me that even if I damaged the man's car, he would make sure no charges were filed. He also wouldn't say anything in his report about this asshole's reproductive organs being destroyed. I asked why. Let's just say that you're not the only man whose wife is a cheating whore. My ex did the same thing to me. Point in favor of us shitty hubbies. He shook my hand, and I showed him the video I recorded from the bedroom. He laughed his head off with me as they started screaming as he creamed his tool before fucking her front for a bit and then fucking her ass. Perfect. After we wiped the tears of laughter from our eyes, and he told me that they would tow this asshole's car at the owner's expense, he shook my hand again and walked away, still chuckling at a slapstick cop comedy where two people fall on top of each other. Friend, trying to get into the shower and bathroom with cold water. But at least the why part of my question was answered. The asshole's tool was seven centimeters longer than me and a little wider. I never thought Cindy was a size queen, but damn, she wanted something more and it was just starting to cost her. I called Paul and asked him to send process servers to the Santa Barbara hospital where Cindy and asshole were taken. I then emailed him evidence of the affair and told him to get a copy of Mrs. Kendall's police statement. He told me he would do so, and I sat back in my chair. I waited for Brian to come home. Now comes the real moral quandary. What should I tell my nine-year-old son about why his mom is in the hospital? I sighed and came up with a plan that wouldn't tarnish her too much. I decided to tell him that mom had a problem with wanting other men besides me, and it wasn't good. I would drill this into my son's head so he wouldn't end up thinking it's okay for women to not sleep with their husbands. Then I remembered how I had overheard their conversation the previous morning and started laughing again. It just occurred to me that she gave me an idea on how to carry out my revenge. I want you to set my ass on fire with that big stick, baby. Yes, those were her words. Well, her wish came true. An hour passed when the hospital called me on my mobile. Hello, I said. 
Marty, that would be my loving wife, a.k.a. Cindy the Slut. Her voice sounded angry. Oh, hi, I said. I assume the process servers found you and your ass? Oh, and a jerk too? I grinned. Fuck you. I don't know what you did to me, but I swear to God I'm going to press charges against your little ass. She screamed. What the hell are you talking about, slut? I shouted back, going on the offensive. I came home to pick up my laptop and found you in the shower with some asshole who obviously had a crush on you. I don't know what the fuck you think I did, but I just found out about it this morning. And now, the marriage contract has come into force, bitch. Don't come home. Brian will live with me, and you won't get a damn thing in the divorce after my testimony is accepted in court. You're lucky I'll let you visit your son, but I will not let you make him think a cheating bitch wife is okay. This took the wind out of her sails. You... You wouldn't. You won't tell him what I did, will you? Damn right, I'll do it. Why not? He deserves to know what the hell his mother is like. I yelled at her some more. Damn slut, how many were there? Is Brian even my son? If not, you tell me who the father is, and I will sue him to return child support for raising his bastard. No, Brian is your son, she said in a quiet voice. Well, you'll excuse me if I run a DNA test on that, I said, not bothering to hide my anger. Then she started to really cry, and every sob was music to my ears. Wow, I was turning into a real bastard. But then I had a reason, just because I wasn't going to be a laughingstock anymore. That honor would go to Mr. Asshole. When Brian returned home, I relented a little and gave him only the minimum information he needed. I turned it into an object lesson in infidelity by telling him that bad things happen to adulterers. In time, Mom would be okay, but she would no longer live with us. He hugged me and said that he loved us both but did not want to live with a grown man. I couldn't help but smile at his incorrect pronunciation. Well, there's not much else to tell, except that the divorce went off without a hitch. I talked to Cindy's father about what happened and told him what I did. He laughed so hard I thought the old man was going to have a heart attack. Cindy eventually made a full recovery, but she never ate salsa again, as far as I know. John, asshole, Lawson, ended up having both of his damaged reproductive organs removed. The official police report stated that it was an accident because he slipped in the shower and hit a bar of soap. I grinned at this. Good old Detective Crawford. A good man. That's him. Last I heard, asshole had left town for an unknown destination. Well, that's what he deserves for having someone else's wife. When I finally learned the truth from Cindy about what had happened to start her affair, she admitted that he had approached her at one of her social events while I was out of town, setting up a contract. She drank too much wine, and as soon as she felt his big male tool inside her, she realized that she wanted him all the time. She said she still loved me and that it was just sex. And I bet you thought the cliché was over? Never. She begged me to take her back. Cliché. She said she would never go astray again, a cliché. I told her to fuck off, cliché, and so on and so forth. Becky and I started dating and she assured me that she was not a size queen, especially after we had sex for the first time and we both came to the finish line. We'll get married in a month and our baby will be born next spring. Brian is excited to have a little brother or sister. The last time I spoke to Cindy after her visit with Brian, we started talking. I should never have cheated on you, Marty, she said with a humble sigh. Why not? I was an idiot, and he set your ass on fire. I grinned, and the shock on her face made me happy. Life is full of cliches, but sometimes life is damn good too. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.